So some of you may have already heard, the North Hertfordshire Museum in Hitchin, UK, a town about 40 miles, 64 kilometers north of London, and 30 miles, 48 kilometers southwest of Cambridge, announced in November 2023 that Roman ruler Ella Gablis would be referred to as she, her, humoring the idea that the Roman aristocrat was trans. Conflicting records seem to indicate that Ella Gablis preferred to be referred to as a lady and even married a former slave and chariot driver named Heracles. These historical testimonies assert that Ella Gablis delighted in being called Heracles' mistress, wife, and queen. Allegedly, Ella Gablis also wore wigs and makeup and dressed in women's clothing. It was also alleged that Ella Gablis offered up large amounts of money to anyone that could have given her what we would refer to today as gender affirmation surgery. While there is some evidence to suggest this, some historical scholars have treated these accounts with caution, and sources of Ella Gablis' life were often antagonistic, as the Imperial's reign was somewhat tumultuous due to clashes over politics and religion at the time, largely with the more aristocratic and senatorial class. This was during the time when Rome was teetering between pagan and Christian rulers, as well as a growing Christian population. And besides those tensions, Rome had remained in a constant state of civil conflict for about the last 100, 200 years as it struggled to maintain its vast empire. It should also be of note that historians throughout the centuries have also been antagonistic towards Elagabalus, and even today, some refuse to even entertain the notion of the Roman ruler being trans, either because of the so-called shaky evidence and or their own transphobia, the latter often being used to further their transphobic agenda and prevent El Gablis from being viewed as a trans woman. However, some historians also attest that the implications of El Gablis's transgenderness, so to speak, could have been a character assassina assassination in regards to the ruler's sexual behavior by calling the ruler like a woman or feminine could have been used as an insult, one of the worst towards uh, people that were assigned male at birth. Take also into account that El Gablis was a Syrian, not a Roman, and there ha could have largely been some racial and ethnic component to it as well. On the other hand, we must take into account the potential bias that goes along with this decision by the museum to recognize Ella Gablis as trans, as it does consult with the LGBT charity Stonewall and the LGBT wing of the trade union Unison. It is also represented, represented by Keith Hoskins, a liberal democratic counselor for the town and an executive member of the arts for the liberal labor coalition run North Hertz Council. It is entirely possible that their implications that Al Gablis is trans could have been seen as a stretch, a vast overreach, in order to be more sensitive and all-encompassing to social justice advocates or to humor the debate over Al Gablis's gender identity from both sides of history, which, frankly, is fair enough. Nothing wrong with at least acknowledging the possibility, I suppose. It shows a non-biased, balanced, and impartial look at history which in the age of misinformation and politically charged discourse is rare and refreshing. Regardless of what one's opinion is on El Gablis, history is constantly changing, and we are always discovering new things, new artifacts, new information, some of which can flip our entire understanding of what we thought we knew upside down. Some people are not going to be welcoming to that change want to cling to their biases and preconceived notions and beliefs. But the fact remains that trans people have not just existed in the scope of our modern history. They have been around for thousands of years. Even a ruler of a vast empire may not have been immune from dysphoria or questioning one's gender identity. That being said, I will agree with Professor Christian Lace, a classicist from the University of Manchester in saying that I think that these attest attestations should be taken with a huge pinch of salt. However, I believe that 
that is how we should look at all history and what we currently think we know. Because you never know when that history, the facts, the information, the knowledge that we have assumed for years could easily change when something new comes to light that may challenge those preconceived beliefs. That being said, I'm going to go out with my own beliefs, but once more I ask you to take it with a pinch of salt, challenge you to do your own research and make your own conclusions. However, it is to my belief, based on various information about Elagabalus's life, that the Roman ruler was transgender. She exhibits most of the signs of unhappiness about being male and the delight of presenting and living as female that I think a lot of us as trans women can definitely relate to. And regardless of her personality or her competence or even sanity as an empress, I think she is one of those figures that trans women do look back and reflect upon as some semblance of an idol. Some of my fellow pagan trans women may even look to her as a goddess of trans womanhood. And by all means, go off, queen. That being said, I still take my own views and my own interpretations, my own biases, beliefs, and the knowledge that I have of history with a huge pinch of salt. And I am never afraid to question myself, my beliefs, or those historical facts, because that's what makes us grow as educators, as scholars, and as human beings. I'm Red Pagan Nicole, and this has been Red Pagan Corner. Until next time.